Good morning, church. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus. I have the joy and privilege of being with you on Christmas Day, and now I have the opportunity to wish you a happy new year. It is wonderful to be with you on this, in the beginning of this new year. Um, I know Pastor Bruce was with you last week, and Pastor Bob is with you on New Year's Day, but I just wanted to add my word of gratitude about the opportunity that we have to walk into this new year together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And I just want to let you know that every opportunity that the Lord has placed for, for me to be here with you and my family to be here with you on the Lord's day truly is an honor and a joy. And we, we always look forward to it. And, you know, I just want to let you know that the test of our love for one another is really going to be, it's really going to get tense here in a couple of weeks if the 49ers and the Eagles end up in the NFC championship. And so I just, I was telling Tito, I, I just want to let you guys know that at the end of the day, I love you more than football, but I love football a lot. Okay. So as you think of my passion for Philadelphia sports, as you've seen on display through sermon illustrations, and even you've gotten in on it. I was telling someone this morning that I'll never forget on Christmas morning when I came in here and the sermon title was up there and next to my name was an Eagles logo. That was amazing. That was a Christmas gift. So uh, thank you for that. Um, but I do really, and I really am grateful. Um, for the, the connection and the relationship the Lord has given our family with you, precious brothers and sisters of Western Hills Church. And it really is an honor to serve you and be here with you. Your kindness to our family over the Christmas holidays was felt in, in very tangible ways through your expressions of love and gifts. And it was just very, very meaningful, very, very unexpected, but not surprising because since the day we've been here with you, we have sensed your love, we sensed your care. And we've sensed your faith and your anticipation for God's mercy upon this church as you look forward to your flourishing future together as a local church. Um, I did want to, before I get into the word this morning, I did want to introduce some friends of ours. One of the reasons why I wasn't able to come to the men's meeting yesterday um, was because we had some friends in town who were visiting, who were special friends. In fact, um, Alex and Bethany Burton. <laughs> It's not Burton, um, to Tandon, I knew that. But I always think Bethany Burton, here's the reason why, because Bethany and Rachel have been friends since college before either one of them were married. So when Rachel was Rachel Adams and Bethany was Bethany Burton, they were close to friends and still are friends now as they have new last names, their friendship continues. Um, but Alex and Bethany and their children, Joshua and Caleb are here with us this morning. They're in for a visit before they head back out to the mission field. Um, they've previously served for eight years as missionaries in China. And this coming spring, they're going to be heading to South Africa. Um, and so they are faithful servants of the Lord Jesus. And if you, I know many of you, uh, I've heard someone saying they're going to Taiwan. Um, different people are going to different um, places in the Asia Pacific, and you have a heart for that place. They've carried that on their hearts for years, and I'm sure you'd love to meet them, get to know them. And I'm just going to be real blunt. They're still raising support for their mission. So, hey, just say hi to them, and maybe you uh, can make a connection with them as they seek to go serve the Lord. And Alex is a, is a good friend, and you can also, you'll also notice if you see him over there that he he's wearing something today that makes me very happy. He's wearing a Philadelphia Eagles hoodie. Um, but we're grateful to have them here with us, um, and they're going to be joining us for this afternoon, hanging out, and it's just going to be some good fellowship. Um, but I'm grateful to be here this morning with the opportunity, again, to teach you God's Word. So you take your Bible and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm usually reading a lengthier section of Scripture, but this morning we're actually just going to look at one verse of Scripture in its context. But one verse of Scripture that I believe the Lord wants to use to instill a, 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 a mega dose of hope into our hearts as we head into the new year. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse 18, let us hear the word of God. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That is God's word. May he have his blessing for his reading and preaching by the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. I find it very interesting. I found this interesting most of my adult life of how quickly the mood changes from December to January. In December, it's the most wonderful time of the year. 
We are, we are feasting and we're celebrating the Christmas season and, and, and we're having such a great time and we're, we're family and we're giving presents. And then in January, we get very introspective. I'm a horrible person who needs to change and here are all the ways I need to change and here are all the resolutions I need to make so I can be someone different than I was last year. Am I the only one that's just surprised by this contrast? In December, it's buy this, eat that. In January, it's get out of debt and lose some weight, right? What a contrast. And even if you don't get caught up in all the New Year's Eve or New Year's resolution hype, I think you probably found yourself heading into 2023 instinctively thinking about areas of your life that need to be different. Ways in which you want to change. And maybe if you're like me, this New Year's resolution thing isn't your first rodeo. And you've had an experience of making resolutions of ways that you want to change. And then two weeks, three weeks into the new year, everything's all messed up. You start that Bible reading plan. And by the time you get to Leviticus, you like just totally fall off. Right? But, but there's this cynicism, this growing cynicism within us that says something like this. I'm just always going to be the way that I am. The things I do, the ways I think, my behaviors, my character, it's just going to kind of stay the way it is indefinitely. And so there's often this gap, church, in between areas of our life that we want to change and our experience of actually changing. Let me say that again. There's often a gap in between our desire to change and our experience of change. And instead of filling that gap with faith, we usually fill that gap with cynicism. I'm just always going to be the way that I am. So my question this morning for us, as we head into the new year, while change and New Year's resolutions and becoming a better you is on the cultural consciousness, I want to address the subject this morning. I think it's very important for us to address as the people of God. And it's this, how can I really change? Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not simply talking about making a couple of New Year's resolutions, about dropping a few pounds, getting out of debt and kicking that old habit. I'm talking about real change. Change at the depth of our being, not just our conduct, but our character. One has said that there's, there's three versions of us that merge together. There's the public us, who we are in the public eye. The way people at work see us, the way people at church see us, the way people at school see us, the, the public us. Then there's the private us, the us that only our family sees, but that our spouse sees and our children see, see and, and, and our, our closest friends see. And then there's the personal us, the us that's only seen between us and God, our thoughts, our dreams, our desires, our longings our appetites. And the kind of change that I want to talk about this morning from the word of God is the kind of change that not only transforms the the public us, not only transforms the, 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 the private us, but the kind of change that transforms the personal us, that changes us at the core of our being. The kind of change that not only transforms what you do, but who you are. According to the Apostle Paul, when you encounter Jesus Christ, your life as a Christian begins with a radical change. The Apostle Paul says later in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new Creation, the old is, come on, past, behold, the new has come. So radical is the change that takes place in the life of the Christian at the moment of conversion. Jesus Christ himself calls it being born again. That's radical. That's drastic. That's dramatic. And although the Christian life begins 
with a radical change, being born again, being regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit and converted to turn from your sin and trust in Jesus Christ. Although the Christian life begins with a radical change, that change is not meant to be a one-time event in the life of the believer. The Christian lives a life of ongoing, perpetual change, renewal, and transformation. There's a Bible word for this. It's sanctification. You say, sanctify what? Sanctification. Sanctification is talking about being set apart by God, for God, to become more like God in whose image you were made. Sanctification is the process by which one becomes less and less sinful and more and more holy by virtue of our union with Jesus Christ. This is a change that works from the inside out, as we just sang a few moments ago. It addresses us, as I said a few moments ago, at every level of our being, public, private, and personal. So, with all of that in mind, if you're a Christian this morning, your life began with a radical change. And God calls you to live a life of perpetual change and transformation. And for some of us at this stage of our Christian life, we might be at, we might be honestly wondering if I'm just going to kind of be where I am now to the day I see Jesus and enter into glory. The answer to that question is no, you can change. We must change because the last I looked around, nobody in this room looks exactly like Jesus Christ. We need to become more and more conformed to the image of Jesus. Are you tracking with me? So the question I want to answer this morning is, how can I experience true change? So here's the big idea that the main lesson we want to consider this morning from the words of the Apostle Paul in just this one verse that has a powerful, packed principle for living the transformed Christian life. I want us to consider this morning this reality. It's this. True change is the consequence of consistent communion with Christ. True change is the consequence of consistent communion with Christ. Let me even make that more concise. You want to be like him? You got to be with him. Let's consider this morning three dynamics of true biblical change that answer the question, how can I experience true change? First, notice with me from the text that true change happens relationally. True ha change happens relationally. Notice the words of verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. Transformation is the consequence of beholding the glory of the Lord. Paul makes it clear in this text that the pathway to experiencing a transformed life, the, the pathway to, to growth and sanctification, the, the pathway to true change is beholding the glory of the Lord. Now, let me give you the context of 2 Corinthians 3 to help us understand how Paul gets to this conclusion in his final statement in this chapter. What Paul is teaching here about true change is being drawn from a real-life experience from one of the, the greatest and most well-known saints in the Old Testament, Moses. There are repeated references to Moses and his relationship with God under the Old Covenant all throughout 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Repeatedly, in verses 7 through 16, Paul is referring to Moses and how he had experiences with, experiences with God that transformed his life. If you're interested in going back and reading that account in its fullness, you can go back in your Bible reading this week and look at Exodus chapter 33 and Exodus chapter 34. But here are some of the highlights, and, and some of these will appear on the screen. 
For instance, in Exodus 33, verse 11, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. Now, if you've been tracking in the Bible, and if you have a good sense of the, of the, of the, of the Old Testament, the, the last thing you'd walk away with, you would think, is to think that God is being presented in this warm, intimate, relational way, but he is. All throughout the Old Testament, God is expressing his desire, his longing, his heart to be in intimate relationship with his people. Remember in the garden, how Adam and Eve walk with God in the cool of the day. God's heart is to have intimate fellowship with human creation to the same degree that God has experienced fellowship within the triune Godhead for all eternity as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have had unbroken, joyful, wonderful, soul-satisfying experiences of fellowship together in the Trinity. God longs for his people to have the same experience with him. And so Moses had that relationship and he would speak face-to-face with God as a man speaks to a friend, Moses would say, I am a friend of God. So Paul wants us to consider how Moses had a, a personal and intimate relationship with God. And Moses would pursue God's presence. And there in God's presence, God would speak to Moses and Moses would speak to God. And they had this vibrant, dynamic, interactive relationship whether they would go to the place called the tent of meeting or Moses would go up on top of Mount Sinai there in God's presence, there would be an interactive relationship experienced. But Paul doesn't want us to only know that Moses and God had a a relationship. He, He not only wants us to know that they experienced fellowship, friendship. He also wants us to know that that relationship had a dramatic effect upon Moses' life. For instance, you'll see up on the screen, Exodus 34, verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Did you catch that? Because... He had been talking with God. Here's causation. Results. Something happened to Moses as a result of talking with God. What was it? His face was shining. The glory of God shining from the presence of God was rubbing off on Moses. The more time Moses spent in the presence of God, the more God's glory rubbed off on Moses. I know this is strange. There are lots of strange and and interesting things to have to walk through and and understand and explain as the, the dynamic of God's relationship with the people of Israel is being developed under the old covenant. But here, here is the big thing we need to walk away with. Moses and God experienced intimacy together. And as a consequence of that communion, Moses was a different man. This won't be up on the screen, but, but listen to Exodus 34, 30 to 33. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses and behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, they put a veil over his face. So this is an interesting comment here, and there's so much more I could say about it that's not really within the purview of the, of the and scope of this particular sermon. But where did Moses find the confidence to serve the Lord? Where did Moses receive the capital to stand before the people of God and to speak to them? It was only after they could tell that he had been with God. You see, people can tell when you're with God. The people around you notice when the shimmer of God's glory 
that's rubbed off on you as a result of being in his presence is seen on the other side of intimacy with God. So they could tell. And so stunning was the transformation. So stunning was the consequence that they had to put a veil over his face. This was not a one-time occurrence. This would happen repeatedly as Moses spent time face-to-face with God. Whenever Moses, Exodus 33, 34, whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. So over and over and over again, Moses is speaking with the Lord. The Lord is speaking with him. He's spending time in his presence. And over time, Moses is showing the results, the consequences, the transformation of being in the presence of God. So there's so much more to unpack from that, but here's the point. The point that we're seeking to understand this morning and correlation between what's happening to Moses and what Paul is teaching the church in 2 Corinthians 3 is this. Moses was being changed as a result of consistently communing with God. In other words, as Moses beheld him, He became like him. He was beholding the glory of the Lord and being transformed into the same image. Moses' interactive relationship with God was changing him in such a profound way that others could not help but notice. So for Moses, change happened relationally. For Moses, spending time with God in intimate communion was a life-changing experience. And here's Paul's point in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. This life-changing relationship was not just for Moses. Through the reconciling death of Jesus Christ on the cross, he has opened the way for all of his people, the church to have access to -to face-to-face, life-changing encounters with God. So that's why Paul says, not just Moses, but we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. But we all, oh, hear the grace of God, church, in those words, but we all, not just Moses, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed into the same image. So even though Moses had a unique role under the old covenant, even though Moses had a unique responsibility as a a prophet and a deliverer, even though Moses had a unique responsibility, church, Moses did not have a unique relationship. The same relationship Moses had with God, we can have with God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Is that not great news? And it's that relationship that's been gifted to us, that friendship that's been gifted to us by God the Father, through God the Son, by the Holy Spirit, changes us from the inside out. You, if you're a Christian, you, like Moses, are a friend of God. And it's that friendship that transforms our lives. Not just Moses, but we all behold the glory of the Lord and are changed into his image. Your intimacy with God will change your life. Change happens relationally. Now, you know as well as I do that we become like the people we spend time with, right? You become like the people you hang out with. This is why when, we, when, when our kids were younger, and even us with teenage kids, we were always wondering, who are they hanging out with? Who are the friends? Why? Because friends have an effect upon you, and you care about the people you spend with and spend time with because you end up becoming like the people you spend time with. If you start hanging out at my house on Sunday afternoons after church, pretty soon you'll be singing with me, fly, eagles, fly, right? My wife and I will be married 22 years this May. 
And we, we, we've enjoyed a sweet relationship. I mean, like everyone else, we have things we have to work through, you know, she throws frying pans at me. Just kidding. <laughs> because she can't reach me. No, I'm just kidding. Just totally kidding. We really don't fight. We have a beautiful relationship and God was very merciful to us. We fell in love when we were in college and we've been dating since. Okay. Um, but you know, what's funny. I find this all the time, even though Rachel and I are very different, different personalities, different backgrounds. I'm tall. She's not. I'm loud. She's got a quiet strength, right? Even though we're very different, there'll be these moments where she says something and I'm like, oh my word, that's exactly the way I would say it. Or I'll be out serving the churches abroad and I'll be sitting down listening to someone share something that they're going through. And then all of a sudden in, in the back of my mind, I'll hear her voice with a gem of wisdom because she's a very wise woman. And I'll share that. That's exactly what Rachel would say. You know, we find ourselves becoming like the people we spend time with. It's a relational dynamic. It's a good dynamic. In fact, that's why fellowship with the body of Christ is so important. As we, as we spend time with one another, as the people of God, we, we rub off on one another positively. And we help, we help sharpen one another uh, where we have rough edges, right? We become like the people we spend time with. And here's Paul's point. The same is true with God. We become like him. We become more like him as we spend time with him. You say, well, how, how, how much of a change are we talking about? What, what kind of change? Well, it's radical. Look at the word here in, in verse 18. Notice the word transformed. This is a very colorful word in the original language. And I don't make it a habit of, 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 of releasing Greek words into the general public, but the Greek word here for transformed is metamorpho. What does that sound like? Metamorphosis, exactly. It's where we get our English scientific term, metamorphosis. This is a, it's a word that, 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 that describes a, a radical transformation. And, and here's a word picture. The, the transformation is so radical that it paints a picture of a, of a slimy caterpillar spinning a cocoon and over time turning into a beautiful butterfly. Now, those of you who snickered, you may be familiar with Pixar's Bug Life, and that's where that line comes from. Maybe you watch that with your grandkids someday. Bug's Life, one of the Pixar fi finest, the old, one of the old ones. But here's the word picture. We become less sinful, less greedy, less lustful, less lazy less gossipy, less self-centered, less self-fill-in-the-blank, self-focused, self-driven. We become less and less sinful and more and more beautiful, reflecting the glory of God in our lives as we spend time with the one who is perfect love perfect grace, perfect justice, perfect wisdom, perfect righteousness, perfect holiness. Church, we become more like him as we spend time with him. Are you following me? True change happens relationally. Now I'm running out of time here. I've I've lingered for a while in spaces that the Holy Spirit led me to linger that I don't normally linger that long in this particular sermon. But I do at least want to give you four recommendations before we move to the final two points that will be brief. I thought you're asking me to be brief. I'm just giving you a heads up. We won't be there as long as we've been in the first point. But four recommendations of where we can go to spend time with Jesus and behold his glory. It's in beholding him as we spend time with him that we become more like him. So where do we go? Where do we go to get a, a, a beautiful vantage point of the glory of Jesus? Well, let me give you four recommendations. You can go and see the beauty of Jesus in his world and in his word, with his people and in his providence. In his world and in his word, with his people and in his providence. In his world, the heavens declare the what? 
glory of God. Let me tell you something. I didn't know you before we made this 3,000 mile trip across the country to move to the Bay. But one of the things that sold us and wanted to serve the Lord here, it's beautiful here. It really is. This is a beautiful place. You know, outside of California, everyone's like California this and California that. California is gorgeous. What a beautiful place. And I remember as we spent time out here seeking the Lord's direction, I was just overwhelmed by the beauty of God that's displayed through the creation of the West Coast. And the beauty of God in, in, in the Bay in particular. This is a beautiful place. But that beauty is meant to be an arrow that directs us somewhere else. The beauty of God's creation points us to the beauty of the creator. And we see in his creation that the heavens are declaring the glory of God. And so for a walk along the coast, a drive down the coast, a walk through the redwoods, some time sitting on the dock of the bay down in Monterey or Santa Cruz, those moments are moments not just to enjoy the gifts in and of themselves, but to allow those beautiful gifts of creation to direct our attention to the one who brought those beautiful things into, into existence through the word of his power. And we know that's Jesus. For by him, all things were created in heaven and earth, things visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. Verses 12 and following. So behold the glory in his world but also behold his glory in his people. This is why the church is so important. This is why COVID was, was such a difficult thing for us to go through. And, and some are still going through. It. I know some are still cautious and, and being careful, but, but there's nothing that replaces this. Being together with God's people, spending time in fellowship in each other's presence. Relationships have limitations as they are experienced at a distance. Ask my daughter, whose boyfriend goes to Syracuse University. What they're able to experience, even through technological advances across the country, are a lot different than when they get to spend time together. And even though I'm grateful for technology and the opportunity for the church to keep worshiping together through the pandemic and through all of those difficult experiences, let's just remember this. There's nothing like being in each other's presence in the people of God. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. As the body of Christ, we are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And we've been given gifts to serve one another in love. We need to experience life together because as we do, we experience our head, Jesus Christ. And we behold his glory in one another. And it changes us. God's world, God's people, God's providence. You know as well as I do that circumstances are used by God to change us. We know that God works all things together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What does that powerful Romans 8, 28 verse say to us? It says this, God uses circumstances to change us. God uses his providence, sweet providences, bitter providences, the good times, the hard times. He uses the pressures of life as well as the privileges of life to change us and make us more like Christ. But most powerfully and most directly, we see the glory of Jesus, not just in his world, not just in his people, not just in his providence, but in his word. We encounter Jesus as we relate to him through the Bible. The Bible is where we see Jesus most clearly and most consistently from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation. We behold the glory of the Son of God as we read the pages of the Word of God. Do you believe that? In the Old Testament, we see the promises of Jesus. In the New Testament, we see the provision of Jesus. Together, the Old and New Testaments are the revelation of Jesus Christ. And there, as we read the pages of God's word, we encounter, we behold the glory of God, and it changes us. One of my favorite quotes on the unique mystical experience of encountering God relationally through the pages of the Bible comes from Robert Mounts. And I have this quote up here on the screen. To meditate on the words of Jesus is to be in communion with him. 
His sayings are not mere words on a piece of paper, but the occasion for a genuine encounter with the living Christ. When we open ourselves to the words of Jesus, we discover that we are in dialogue with Jesus himself. Such is the mystery of the word of God. You want to behold the glory of the son of God? You want to behold the beauty of Jesus Christ, your redeemer? Then don't keep your Bible closed Monday through Saturday. Oh, it's important that we come together and open God's word and, and be called to worship through it and to give ourselves to the study of it and to sing songs that are saturated with it. But my brothers and sisters, there's nothing that can replace the consistent communion and life transforming experience that comes from opening our Bibles and hearing from God and beholding the beauty of Jesus day by day. I hope you say amen to that. So, here is the application under this first and very long point. You want to change? You want to change inside out? You want to grow? You want to go further down this road called sanctification? There's only one way. Spend time with Jesus. True change happens relationally. Let me just mention these final two points. Second, true change happens incrementally. Change is the overflow of ongoing encounters with Jesus over time. It says here that we are being transformed to the same image from one degree of glory to the next. From one degree to the next. This is talking about a process. You see, transformation in the life of the Christian is not an event, it's a process. And if you're like me, you're not only aware of ways in which you need to change, you're also probably aware of ways that other people around you need to change. In fact, you're probably more aware of the ways that people around you need to change than you are even aware of how you need to change. So if you need to know a little bit more about how you need to change, ask your spouse. Ask your brother, ask your sister, ask your best friend. But when you do this and you recognize this, realize this, that the change that we want to see in our own lives and the change we want to see in the lives of people around us don't happen overnight. Change is a process, not an event. So there are two really, really important principles to draw out of that reality. Number one, Change requires patience. I ain't got time for that. Exactly. By the grace of God, you need time for that. Because change takes time. But you know how we want to change? We want to change like that. How many of you have ever had a Chia pet? Anybody ever have a chia pet? Okay, I, I see some hands here. Okay, chia pets are these little terracotta planters. And there were infomercials for these things. I mean, all throughout the 80s and 90s. I mean, I couldn't watch Saturday morning cartoons without seeing a infomercial for ch -ch -ch chia, right? <laughs> Thank you. Someone's remembering this. And so you take the terracotta head and you, and you take some water in the seeds and you kind of plaster it on the terracotta head. And then overnight, literally overnight, boink, 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 that head's got an Afro, right? And they're still making these things. You go to the as seen on TV stores, they're everywhere. They're cheap. They're fun. But you know what? We don't change like that. Psalm 1 says that we change like an oak tree planted by rivers of water that bears its fruit in its season. How long are seasons? Months. Months made up of weeks, weeks made up of days, days made up of hours. In other words, over time. That's the way we change church. And so realizing that change is a process, not an event, we must, by the grace of God, be patient as we wait for our own lives to change and as we wait for the people around us to change. Are you with me? 
Second principle out of this is change not only requires patience, change also requires perseverance. We don't just become unangry overnight. Little by little, inch by inch, the kid's song says, by the yard, it's hard. By the inch, what a cinch. Never stare up the stairs, just step up the steps. That's how we change. But we do take steps. One day at a time, persevering and beholding the beauty of Jesus. Persevering in communing with Christ. Persevering in, in being with him and spending time with him day by day. And what happens in a relationship as we spend consistent time encountering that intimacy, that relationship grows, that relationship strengthens, that relationship becomes second nature, that relationship becomes a vital part of our lives and that relationship changes us. So change happens over time, one degree of glory to the next. Change requires patience and perseverance. Ch true change happens incrementally. Finally, true change happens supernaturally. I don't want to give the wrong impression here. I don't want to give the wrong impression that, hey, if you just kind of pull up your bootstraps and, and get a little bit more disciplined and start reading your Bible and start going for walks and looking at the trees and all of a sudden, presto, change, you're going to be more like Jesus. Even though we have to, even though we have to give ourselves to the process, even though we have to place ourselves in close proximity to Jesus to behold his glory, Paul wants something to be crystal clear. It's not our perseverance that changes us. It's the Lord who changes us. The last words of verse 18 for this, this what? This transformation comes from the Lord who is the spirit. It is God who changes us. It is God who transforms us. It is God who over time makes us more loving like Jesus, more gracious like Jesus, more patient like Jesus, more gentle like Jesus, more generous like Jesus, more wise like Jesus, more self-controlled like Jesus, more faithful like Jesus. Over time, the Holy Spirit transforms us into the image of Christ. That's why we call those things the fruit of the Spirit. It's the spirit who transforms us. It's the spirit who radically changes our lives from the inside out, producing these good fruits that look like the beauty of Jesus. Why is this important to keep in, play, keep in mind? Number one, this is an issue of dependence. You must depend upon the Lord, depend upon the spirit to use your perseverance, to use your, your, your pursuit of Christ and your time in the word and your time in prayer and your, your time with one another, you need to depend upon the Holy Spirit of God to make those times make a difference. You need dependence. This is why it's an issue of dependence. It's not only an issue of dependence, it's also an issue of doxology. Why do I say that? Because the one who does the change gets the glory. The one who changes us gets the recognition. And if it's the spirit of God who changes us, Jesus gets the glory. Because Jesus told us in John chapter 14 through 16 that the spirit works to make much of Christ. So the one who changes us gets championed. The one who changes us gets the glory. At the end of the day, it's the Holy Spirit of God that transforms us and makes us more like the Son of God, the glory to the glory of God the Father. You want to change? It can happen. You can be different than the way you are today, on the inside, on the outside. Your public life, your private life, your very, very personal life can change. And this is how it happens. It, it's hard for me to preach a sermon without giving some type of pop cultural reference to Philadelphia. That's, that's my repertoire. This is what you get when you get me. 
Uh, but I think it's very, very funny that in film, one of those famous athletes is a fictitious character. Rocky Balboa. In fact, our family lived about a mile away from the art museum steps. We call them the Rocky Steps. People come from all over the country to, to run up those steps and, and kind of do this at the top. Well, that's, we lived right by that. And I would I'd take our dog, my dog Vader for a walk there and we'd go up those steps and I'd take pictures with him over the city. Well, I love the Rocky films. If you love a good underdog story, whether you're from Philly or not, you got to love the Rocky films. They're good. They're actually very wholesome too. They're very, very clean. But out of all the Rocky films, my favorite one is Rocky IV. It's Rocky versus the Russian champion, Ivan Drago, right? And so there's all this hype leading up to this match between Rocky Balboa, USA's champion, and Ivan Drago, Russia's champion. And this fight's going to take place on what, what Rocky perceived as enemy territory. It's going to happen in Moscow. And so here they are in this, in this really dingy lit arena, just absolutely packed with, with Russian soldiers all wearing their Russian regalia. And here's Rocky fighting Ivan Drago. And they're going back and forth, exchanging blow for blow. And as usual, Rocky's face begins to look like one big bloody prune. But then things start to change. And Rocky starts fighting back. His eyes are closed, but he's landing his punches. And all of a sudden, he not only starts to beat, he not only starts to start winning the fight, the crowd starts cheering for Rocky instead of Ivan Drago. This, this Russian crowd starts cheering for USA's champion. You know what I said, even as a teenager when I watched that? Yeah, right. There was some propaganda in this film. They wanted to use this film as, as proof that, the, that the, the tension that's always existed between USA and Russia would change. And I'm like, no way. The Cold War is not going to end because of Rocky, okay, in 1987. Well, Rocky wins the fight. Everyone's cheering for him. Even Gorbachev, the guy who's playing Gorbachev, is clapping for Rocky. And then Rocky grabs the microphone, and he gives this speech, this very memorable speech, if you know the film. He says, during this fight, I've seen lots of changing. Changing in the way you look at me and changing in the way I look at you. And if I can change and you can change, we all can change. Yo, Adrian. Right. And you're probably thinking, if you never saw the film, that is so corny. Yeah, right. There's just some things that will never change. And maybe that's the way you think about yourself this morning. There's just some things that will never change. Left to yourself, you might be right. But with Jesus, you couldn't be more wrong. You can change. I can change. Church, we all can change. Because Jesus Christ left heaven and came to earth to live for us, and die for us, and rise for us, and bring us into a life-transforming relationship with the triune God. And the more time we spend with him, the more we will become like him. True change is the consequence of consistent communion with Christ. Church, you might not get through your read the Bible in a year plan in 2023, but if you will spend consistent time with Jesus day by day, you will be different and God will be glorified. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this hopeful, hopeful principle from Scripture. Thank you that even though we're, we're not what we want to be or should be, we praise you, God, that we're not who we used to be because you saved us. And you've transformed our hearts from the inside out. And you've brought us into communion with you, Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that we can have a friendship with you like Moses did. A friendship with Jesus like the 12 disciples, the apostles did. Thank you that we can commune with you because we have access to your presence through the blood and righteousness of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters here at Western Hills Church. 
that 2023 would be a year where there is true change experienced in each and every one of their lives. Not because they have it all together, not because we have it all together, because in your presence, we are transformed. And so may this be a year where we spend more time with you and with one another. And as a result, become more and more like Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.